Okay, can you all hear me? Is this thing on? Great, thank you very much. Um, yeah, first slot after lunch, lucky me. Um, I hope you all ate well. Uh, my name is Mark West and I'm here today to talk about data science. And um, I'm going to try and cut through some of the hype. There's a lot of hype around data science. I'm going to try and give you a good idea of like, what data science is, how it relates to machine learning, and to finally give you some tips for getting started with your own data science and machine learning projects. I wrote this talk um, not so long ago, and when I started writing it, I was like, very focused on trying to make it as practical as possible, but I soon realized that like, when you start talking about data science, you have to include some theory. So there will be some theory in here as well, um, but I hope that like, it's useful for you all. Uh, my name is Mark West. You can see my Twitter handle down in the bottom right-hand corner, and after the talk, I'm going to put my slides out on SlideShare. So like, um, you know, if you look on the NDC, Oslo hashtag after the talk, you'll find my, talk, my slides there. So who the devil am I? This is my first time speaking at NDC. Um, I'm actually from the, the, the other side of the water. I'm, uh, well, for many years I've worked as a, a Java developer and architect. And um, in the middle of last year, I was given the task of building up a data science department at my uh, company, Bouvet, here in Oslo. So this talk comes from the perspective of a computer scientist who has actually learnt data science. And in my spare time, I'm the leader of the Norwegian Java user group called Java Bin, and we arrange a conference called uh, Java Zone that some of you may have heard of. But anyway, enough of that. Let's get on with the talk. My talk is split up into three sections. So if you fall asleep in one of them and wake up for the next one, you'll, you know, get, you'll still get some benefits. So I'm going to start off by talking about what data science is. I'm going to define it. I'm going to talk about how it relates to machine learning. I'm going to talk about the roles you need and how you can get started with your own data science projects. I'm then going to have a little bit of theory. I'm going to go on to the machine learning side. I'm going to talk about uh, some different algorithms, that you, well, the most common algorithms you use for machine learning. I'm not going to talk about neural networks today. Uh, a lot of people, they equate machine learning with neural networks, but like, uh, that's, well, machine learning has a lot of other tools available, and I'm going to focus on some of those. And finally, I'm going to run through a practical example using some open source data science uh, tools. So, to start off with, what is data science? Well, to understand what data science is, you have to understand why data science. Why is there so much focus on data science today? And it's basically because we are a data-driven society. And we're, we're all aware of that, right? I mean, you read about like Facebook and what is it, Cambridge Analytica and swinging elections and Twitter bots and all that kind of nonsense. You know, the data is out there and it's being used, both for, for evil and for good. And our employers, now our customers, they also want to be data-driven. They also want to get the value out of data. So it's no surprise, really, that there's so much hype around data and data science. And already in 2010, Harvard Business Review said that data science will be the sexiest job of the 21st century. And you know, what's really happened in the last few years is that we have access to you know, more storage and more processing power than we've ever had before. And that's led to the whole AI machine learning paradigm. It's been less academic and it's been made available to us, you know, mere mortals. So basically, Microsoft, Amazon, Google, they've all provided us with tools that we can use to get easily started with our own machine learning projects. I think this quote here, or this, this, this definition of data science is pretty good. And it, yeah, it's from Wikipedia, but it's pretty good. It says that data science is an interdisciplinary field of scientific methods, processes, and systems to extract knowledge and insight from data. And if we drill down into this, we'll get a bit more insight into what data science is. Firstly, that it's interdisciplinary. Now, I reckon that most people in this room work with computer science and like, you know, work with software engineering, which is at the boundary between domain knowledge and computer science. So in other words, we learn about our customers and our, our employees' domains, and we write code, rules, and whatever, that kind of reflects that business knowledge using our computer science skills. But in, if you want to add data science to this, you need something else. You need the math and statistics side, right? I mean, like, this is pretty obvious stuff. It means that like, to work with data science, you have to either be a computer scientist with good understanding of math and statistics, or a person with a kind of natural science background, say a physicist, who has a good knowledge of computer science. And don't forget a domain knowledge. A lot of people think that like, the data scientist is basically a unicorn because it's impossible to be an expert in all these areas. But I don't feel you need to be an expert in these areas. You can come from one side, 
for example, computer science, and you can use time to build up your math and statistics knowledge and, and succeed as a data scientist. Just like a physicist can start a job as a data scientist, learn computing skills, and do a good job. If we go back to our definition of what data science actually is, well, it talks about data science being scientific, and data science is scientific. It's a scientific process. It's driven by hypothesis and observation. So when you start a data science project, you need a hypothesis. And the hypothesis can be very specific, or it can be quite loose. It can be, can I find out how much my house is worth based on historical knowledge and what I know about my house? That could be a hypothesis. And once you have your hypothesis, you then need your data. That takes ages. You've got to talk to all the people who own the data and get hold of it. Then you have to get the data in somewhere, and you need to aggregate it. That takes time. Once you have the data, you need to start playing around with it, understand what's missing. Um, is there any insight you can get from the data? Is there any parameters that, uh, that maybe are duplicated? Is there any extra parameters that you can generate from the data you have? These first three steps are 80%, in my opinion, are 80% of the data scientist's job. You do all of this, and then you can start messing around with modeling. And like you build, you know, number, step number four is about you know creating a model. You can use machine learning in step number three, of course you can to understand the data. But when you're actually going to create a model to prove your hypothesis, that's step number four, and that has to happen after you've gathered your data and you understand it. The next step after that, of course, is interpreting the output. <laughs> your model, the resulting model or the resulting output from the model, may not be what you expect, and you may need to use some time to understand what insights you're actually getting from the model before you, uh, before you can actually communicate it to the stakeholders. And communication, that requires other skills. That requires the storytelling skills. Because if you're communicating to stakeholders who don't know anything about math and statistics, and you're trying to explain what your algorithm just generated, you're going to struggle. You need to find a way of communicating to all kinds of people. And of course, you end up with a result. Now, this looks like a kind of waterfall step-by-step -step method. Of course, all of these steps are iterative. You know, you can iterate between these. And there's lots of examples, other examples out there of data science processes. I know that Microsoft did their team data science process. You have the old uh, CRISP data mining process. There's lots of different ones out there, but they all have these basic things in common. And the other thing to remember with this, this process here doesn't even talk about putting your model in production. Because data scientists often forget about that. And that's because data scientists shouldn't really care about putting models in production. That requires other roles. So the data scientist is there proving and disproving a hypothesis. They're building models. They're, kind of like, they're, they're, they're playing with algorithms, and they're communicating the results. But you need the data engineer if you're going to build pipelines, if you're going to gather the data, if you're going to put your model into production, and you're going to maintain it. Not only that, you're going to need somebody who helps you with the storytelling. You're going to need somebody who can visualize your data. They say every picture. Tells a thousand, says a thousand words, right? So, like, if you can get somebody who's good at visualizing your data, you can get, you can generate insight from your data very, very easily. And of course, you need a process person. You can call that a project manager, but the important thing about that role is that they need to be able to manage the stakeholders' expectations. So your stakeholders aren't, you know, your stakeholders are like, well, let's do machine learning. And they're like, yeah, we're going to do machine learning. It's going to change the world. And then after eight weeks, they haven't got something because the data scientist is still trying to gather all the data. Someone needs to maintain the, uh, the vision and manage the stakeholder expectations so the stakeholder, in other words, your boss or your customer, doesn't say, oh, you know what, this isn't working. Data science is all about extracting knowledge. Does that sound you know, familiar to you? Does it maybe kind of sound a bit like BI? Is data science just the rebranding of business intelligence? And I think that's a really fair question. Who thinks that BI is just, oh, sorry, that data science is just, you know, old stuff in the new wrapping? I mean, be free to put your hand up. I mean, like, you know, it's a fair thing. There are some people who, who believe this, you know? And it's, that's fair. I personally don't agree with it. But I say that data science is perhaps more of an evolution of business intelligence. I feel that the, the differentiation between, a, between business intelligence and data science is becoming more fuzzy over time. And it is possible to have a data warehouse and a data lake sitting side by side in your production environment, and they're both giving value. And I, uh, some of the areas where I think that data science adds to business intelligence, um, and this is adapted from, from a great article I found on LinkedIn, I have to be honest about that, but like some of the areas that data science ev evolves from BI is, like, for example, data sources. 
like BI traditionally is about structured data. It's about data warehouses, databases, you know, schema on right. Whereas data science allows you to work with more unstructured data, you know, log files, tweets, you know, the stuff is the images, the audio files. Not only that, but like data science gives you advanced technologies, access to advanced technologies. So, so traditionally with BI, you'd be working with visualization and statistics. But machine learning gives you, you know, more power. You know, you can like basically use the machine learning algorithm to generate rules rather than you writing the rules for your code, that you let the machine learning generate the rules for you. And goals as well. What do you get out of BI? BI is about steering the ship, right? The Titanic trying to avoid the iceberg. Whereas data science adds the ability of adding advanced functionality to your systems. Self-driving cars, chatbots, you name it, automation, facial recognition, and so on and so forth. Stuff that BI never really thought of doing because that was completely out of BI's uh, scope. So while I'm talking about machine learning, there's always talk about machine learning, AI, deep learning. What do these all mean and how do they relate to each other? You know, in my world, AI is just like a general broad term that like, uh, refers to everything that's about making computers mimic humans. So like R2D2, you know, C3PO, HAL 9000, all of that is, you know, in, my, in my head, AI. It's not necessarily what we're doing today. What we're doing is machine learning. We're using algorithms to help us predict based on historical data and describe new data. That's, that's machine learning. And deep learning is actually a part of that. Deep learning is about building neural networks that like, have like, more than one hidden layer. So neural networks traditionally have an input layer, an output layer, and possibly a layer in the middle, which is where you map from the input to the output. And if you have like, lots of layers in your hidden layer, that's deep learning. So it's basically a neural network with lots of layers. Now, deep learning, again, is, in my opinion, is an advanced topic, and I won't be covering that anymore today. I'm going to be focusing on more general machine learning. So we're almost at the beginning, the end of the first part of the talk. So the key takeaways is that data scientists require math and statistics skills in addition to the stuff that we do every day. Uh, data science is hypothesis driven. To undertake a data science project, you, tr you need a range of competences. So you don't necessarily need the four different people, one doing data science, one doing data engineering. You can have one person that does more than one role. But you need to cover those competences in your team. And in my opinion, data science can be seen as an evolution of business intelligence. It brings more functionality and technology to the table. So we can go on now to uh, talk about some machine learning algorithms. And just to refresh, machine learning is about allowing your computers to learn without you programming them. So traditionally, you would give the computer the rules. You would say, this is how I want you to process things. But with machine learning, you give the, 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 the algorithm, you give it data. And then the algorithm generates a model that has its own rules. And when we're talking about models and algorithms, just to reiterate, so we have training data that goes into an algorithm. And then the algorithm produces a model. There's a lot of people that get confused. You know, so compute, uh, this is actually the right terminology. When you're talking about machine learning algorithms, you're talking about things that generate a model. And the other thing to remember when you're creating models in machine learning, you need to be relatively generalized. So imagine that like, I want to create a, a machine learning model that can, can look at a picture and tell me if a car is in the picture. And imagine that all my training data is based on these high performance sports cars. OK, so everything's working. I put my, my model into production. And then the first picture that comes is this, or this, or this. I mean, they're all cars. We see them as cars. But a machine learning algorithm, if it's not general enough, it's going to struggle because it's going to think every car looks like these here. So it's very important when you're creating your machine learning models that you try to make them general, but not too general. And that's where the, that's where the challenge is. It's all about basically creating a model that's appropriate, which has an acceptable error margin, which is gener general enough, but also pays attention to the underlying patterns in your training data. You don't want something that's underfitted that ignores underlying patterns, or something that's overfitted that, like, you know, is 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 uh, overfitted so much that it focuses on modelling the training data perfectly, and when it gets new data, it struggles. In fact, this I found on Twitter. This is a great ex example of overfitting. Anybody who knows you know, machine learning and the terminology, you know, here is somebody has designed the bed based on how one person sleeps. That's the training data, right? So when anybody else tries to sleep on that bed, or if that person changes position, it doesn't work. So that's a great example of overfitting. 
So machine learning types, there's three basic types. You can argue this backwards and forwards, but there are three basic types that most people agree on. You have supervised learning, which is about prediction. So with supervised learning, you train the model based on historical data, and then you say you ask it to infer new values based on what it's learned. Unsupervised learning is about describing your data. So you give your data to the algorithm, and the algorithm attempts to describe your model based on its features. And finally, you have reinforcement learning, which is a sexy one. Reinforcement learning is the model that is constantly learning, it's constantly evolving. The first two uh, paradigms here, supervised and unsupervised learning, often result in static models that don't change. Whereas reinforcement learning is constantly learning. So you can imagine reinforcement learning is like learning to juggle or to play chess or something like that. And again, reinforcement learning is advanced, and we're on the introduction side, so we're going to ignore that today and focus on supervised and unsupervised learning. And three basic types of, uh, or, uh, of machine learning that belong, to, belong here. You have regression, which is about predicting a continuous value, for example, the, the, the value of a house. You have uh, classification, which is about saying, OK, is this an apple or an orange? And then on the unsupervised side, you have clustering, which is about finding groups in your data. So I'm going to go through some examples of these. And just, just in very, very, very quick overview of these, I'm not going to go in lots of detail. I'm going to start with linear regression. Linear regression is the uh, machine learning algorithm that a lot of people say isn't machine learning because it's so simple. Imagine here I have some historical data which tells me how much I can get for a house based on its size. This is great. So basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a model where I can predict the price of a house based on its size. And that's simple. First, I just separate my data into feature and label. So the feature is what I'm going to be putting in, and label is like examples of what I, want, what I want to get out of the model. And if I plot it, my data looks pretty much like this. So you have like a nice, this is why I'm only using two dimensions, because it's easy to visualize. So I have like a, a nice little 2D plot of uh, my uh, floor space and house prices. So if I feed this data into a linear regression algorithm, it will generate one of these. This is my model. It's a straight line because it's linear regression. It can be also called a trend line. And basically, based on that trend line, I can make predictions. So I can say, OK, based on the trend line, if I have a house which is around about 5,000 square meters, I can expect to get approximately 1.5 million for it. And that's it. That's linear regression. It's as simple as that. Of course, its simplicity makes it very weak in some ways. Because like, for example, here we have an example of a deviation. This is a, a data point from my, tra my training data, which is a long way away from that trend line, which indicates that perhaps my model isn't good enough. And let's admit, you know, let's admit it. I mean, like, my model is based on the, the size of a house. It doesn't take account to where the house is, how many rooms it has, how many bedrooms it has, what state it's in, right? So there's lots of other features here that really should be in the model. So a deviation you know, indicates that my model is quite weak. It also, though, could be an outlier. An outlier is an anomaly in your data. It could be an error. Missing data, something like that. And outliers are dangerous, because when your model tries to draw a line through all of these uh, spots that is as close to all the spots as possible, because that's how linear regression works, it tries to draw a line that, that is as close as possible to all these different data points. If you have an outlier, it's going to drag your trend line away from where it should be. So that's a weakness with linear regression. So very, very quickly, linear regression is easy to understand. It's transparent. But outliers can skew the trend line. And of course, it's a linear regression, so it doesn't work well with nonlinear relationships. But you can find other alternatives of regression that work better with uh, nonlinear relationships. I'm going to go into classification and support vector machines. Support vector machines are relatively, not relatively, but like, I don't know, about 15, 20 years old. Uh, so they're relatively new compared to some of the other algorithms that are out there. And um, they took me quite a while to get my head around. But basically, support vector machines are about classifying your data. And here I have some training data, where I have all my data points. And they're already classified. In, they're already, they've already got their um, classes. One's green and one's blue. And what I would do is I would normally feed this into an algorithm. And the algorithm would tell me, OK, it would give me a model that could predict the class of new data. So how support vector machines does works is it's basically going to define a line between these classes. And visually, it's very easy to draw a line between these classes, right? You can draw it here. You could also draw it here. You could draw it here as well. And that's the question. Where should your line be to get the best results from new data when you try and test your model with new data? Where should the line be? And um, support vector machines have an a opinionated uh, a, a solution to this. What they do 
is they will, supply, they will find the data points in each class that are closest to data points on the opposite side. These are the support vectors. And it will then use these support vectors to, to find an optimal boundary between your classes. So any, from now on, any like, uh, data points that fall on this side of the line will be blue, and any data points on the other side will be green. And that's great. But there's a problem. What if there's outliers in the boundary? They could actually force your model to be wrong, right? They could actually force the line, the optimal boundary, to be in the wrong place. Or what if you have you know, somewhere like this where the line between the data isn't necessarily so easy to draw? Now, the thing is, it's very, very important uh, that you could draw a line between these, you know, because support vector machines support nonlinear lines. But the problem is, is that like, uh, if these are outliers on the edge, you're going to end up with a model that isn't very good. So basically what support vector machines do is they, they allow you to define a buffer zone. You can make it as big or as small as you want. And here I've just generated a small buffer zone. And any training data in that buffer zone is ignored. So we only pay attention to the training data outside the buffer zone, which allows us to define an optimal boundary which ignores outliers and noise in our training set. So support vector machines are very resistant to outliers and they work well with linear and nonlinear boundaries and they're good with high feature sets, with large feature sets, high dimensions. But they can be a bit tricky to tune and they do work best with binary classification where you're basically saying true or false. Decision trees that I like because they really fit into my understanding of the world as a computer programmer. Because decision trees are basically a flowchart, right? So imagine here I have some test, um, a test example. And this test example is a very normal decision tree example. And sometimes people use it to decide whether to play golf or sometimes they use it to decide whether they're going to play tennis. I use it to decide whether I'm going to play golf or not. So basically, based on the features, the outlook, the temperature, the humidity, and the wind, then I decide whether to play golf. And I then can separate my data into features and labels. If I feed that into a decision tree algorithm, I will get something that can be visualized like this. It's an upside down tree. And at the top, I have my roots, then I have my branches, and finally, I have my leaves. And it's just a flow chart. But how does the decision tree algorithm build this flow chart? How does it decide which feature to prioritize first? Well, it does, it does something called reper recursive partitioning. And the algorithm looks at your data and tries to find the best feature that splits your data into two homogeneous groups. And uh, the feature that it finds first that's best at splitting the data is the outlook. And then it goes on to the next leaf and so on and so forth until it reaches some kind of stopping criteria. Either it models everything and like, all the data points at the bottom are the same values, or if uh, you reach another threshold, like how deep do you want your tree to be? Because the deeper your tree is, the more prone it is to overfitting. So decision trees are very easy to understand. They're flexible, can use them for regression and classification. They're resistant to outliers, and they handle non-linear boundaries, but they are susceptible to overfitting. That means that, like, basically, your model will be, very effect will be affected on where the algorithm decides to slice your data. And if you have some noise in, in, your, um, in your training data, which affects where the data is sliced, you can end up with anomalous results. The final algorithm I want to talk about very quickly is k-means clustering, which is actually my favorite, because it's so nice to visualize. And um, k-means clustering is about describing your data, grouping your data without doing any training. So this is describing, not predicting. And I have uh, some test data here which I've generated. And um, basically, k-means clustering is all about grouping this data into groups. k is basically the amount of clusters the algorithm will try and find. K needs to be large enough to get meaningful patterns, but not so, you know, so large that it's meaningless. So there's 150 data points here. If I had 100 clusters, that would be kind of meaningless. If I had one cluster, that would also be meaningless. Right? So you need to find the right value for K. And how do you calculate that? Well, there's different ways of doing it. But an easy way of doing it is by calculating the K value using screen plots. And this is a screen plot based on the data I've just shown you. And uh, what the screen plot, well, how you generate a screen plot, you run k means with lots of different cluster sizes, and you plot the, um, basically, you plot the amount of clusters against the sum of squared error. Now, I don't want to go into too much detail about this, but the sum of squared, squared error is the same as if you, if you fire a, a, a bow and arrow at a target, if you hit it right in the middle, that's like being in the center of the cluster, and then your, your error will be zero. But if you are a little way away from the, the center of the target, then that's an error. 
so basically what the sum of squared errors is about is it's looking at the cluster and it's saying how far is each data point away from the center of the cluster. The more clusters you have, the lower your sum of squared error. And like basically what you're doing with the scree plot is you're trying to find the elbow of the plot. Anybody want to guess where the elbow is? Yeah? Was that, sorry? Is that me? Three? No, I, 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 thought, I, thought you saw, sorry, I thought the guy behind you raised his hand, sorry. There's, um, <laughs> yeah, it, you're right, it's actually at three. The, the, error, the elbow is at three. So I take three and then I take it back and I run my algorithm saying I want you to find three clusters. The first thing the algorithm does is it finds three centers and it just places them wherever it wants to. These three centers are placed completely randomly. So the next thing well, the algorithm will do, it will allocate each data point to a cluster based on how far that data point is away, is away from the, the center of that cluster. But then it's, now it's done that, now the centers are no longer at the center of their cluster. So we have to move the centers to the center of the cluster. And then we have to update all the data points again so they belong to the cluster that they're closest to, and so on and so forth. And after like six iterations, you end up with a stable model. Now we have three clusters. And that's basically how k-means clustering works. Now k-means clustering has, it's, uh, it's very fast, it's very easy to do but it really focuses on spherical clusters because you're calculating the Euclidean distance between the data point and the center of the cluster. So it's going to generate circular clusters and it's not very, it doesn't, like, it doesn't like it when you have a data point that can be assigned to two clusters, for example. So K-means clustering is powerful and quick, but if you have clusters that aren't spherical, maybe you need to look at a different type of algorithm. So that, that's basically it for the machine learning algorithms. But like, does, does machine learning need data science skills? Because we can use a product. It's very easy to use a product these days and just like, like Azure machine learning or whatever. And you're just pumping your data. And then you'll get like, you know, success out. I mean, is it that easy? I would argue it isn't. I would, say, I would argue that you need data science skills. So that's, that's why he's saying yes. He's saying, yes, you need data science skills. <laughs> Just to kind of like, but um, basically you need data science skills because you need to kind of be able to select and work with the data going in. You need to like do proper variable selection. You need to engineer your features. You need to kind of like impute missing data, that kind of thing. You need to understand how the algorithms work. You need to know which one to use and how to tune it. And you also need to inter how to interpret, evaluate, and communicate the results from your model. So yes, you do need data science skills to work with this kind of stuff. So key takeaways are there's three types of machine learning. You need to gen create models that are generic enough, not too generic, but generic enough. So you get that, that, got that sweet spot between overfitting and underfitting. And that often means that you just have to generate the model lots of times and see where you get the best uh, results with new data. Machine learning algorithms are just tools. If you don't know how to use them, they're not going to work. You're not going to get good results. You need to understand how they're working. And finally, you need data science skills to work with machine learning. So now we're going to go over to the practical part of the talk, where I'm going to basically show you just some stuff that I've done. And this is, this is very simple, low-level stuff. Um, basically, I'm going to be focusing on the hello world of machine learning, which anybody who's played with machine learning has probably played with the Titanic data set. And basically, you have a data set where you, which you use to uh, build a model for predicting survivability of the Titanic. And um, in my case, I'm going to go with a simple hypothesis that I can predict Titanic survivability based on age, gender, and ticket class. Now, the reason I chose Titanic today was because we all know Titanic. We've all, well, probably mo not everybody will admit to having seen the film, but I'm sure that most of you have. And those that haven't have read about it or have heard about it from pop culture. So I don't have to use lots of time to explain the domain. The reason I'm choosing age, gender, and ticket class, well, age and gender is like women and children first. We've all heard that, right? And the other thing is ticket class, because you know, it was very clear from watching the film Titanic that the first class passengers were treated a lot better than poor old uh, Leonardo DiCaprio, right? So that's why I'm going to use these three values to try and predict survivability. This is what the Titanic data set looks like. Uh, without going too much into detail on every value, but you have a unique ID for the passenger, survival, whether they survived or not, the class, which is one, two, or three. Number one is first class, number three is third class. The gender, the age, the, the amount of siblings and spouses on board, 
the amount of parents and children on board, the ticket number, the fare, the cabin number, the port of embarkation, which is either Queenstown, Cherbourg or Southampton, and finally, the passenger name, which includes the honorific. The honorific is Mr, Mrs, Sir, Lady, and so on and so forth. So I'm going to be focusing on predicting this value based on these ones. The tools I'm going to be using, I'm going to be using scikit-learn. Scikit-learn is a uh, Python distribution which uh, includes other Python libraries, uh, which uh, basically allow you to do machine learning. So scikit-learn itself uh, has implementations of different machine learning algorithms, and it also packages up um, some other Python libraries, such as NumPy, which is good for doing maths, uh, Pandas, which is good for data sets, and Matplotlib, which is good for visualizing your data. I'm going to be showing you the code in the Jupyter Notebook. Jupyter Notebook is a very handy tool where you can basically both write code and run it, but also write notes. So it's very good if you want to share the results of your data science project with others. And if you want to use these and play with Scikit-Learn and Jupyter, rather than downloading them separately, I would definitely recommend downloading Anaconda. That's a distribution with like, lots of machine learning and data science uh, tools built in, such as uh, I think you have like, uh, I think actually we've got a Visual Studio version in there as well. So let's switch over to my uh, Jupyter Notebook. I might have to mess a little bit around with the resolution. Look at that. <laughs> might have to look at, mess around with the resolution so you can actually see what's going on here. But let's see if we can just zoom in a little bit. Yeah, OK. So the first thing I'll do is I've got my data set in a, in a CSV file. So I'm going to import my data using something called pandas. And uh, this is what the data looks like when I've got it in. Pandas gives me all my data, my CSV data, in a nice little data frame. And we can already see there's some interesting stuff here. We can see the honorific, for example is always at position number two in the name. So if you tokenize the honorific, you will definitely be able to pick out, sorry, if you tokenize the name, you'll be able to pick out the honorific. We also notice that uh, male and female is set to strings, and age has some missing values. You have a null value here and a null value here. So what Pandas does, it gives us the ability to actually generate reports based on our data. So if we zoom into this here, we can see that we actually get some insight into the numeric parts of our data. We can see that we have 891 uh, values, uh, 891 rows in our data set. We can see that age is missing 177 values. And that's an issue because we want to impute, well, we want to calculate survivability based partly on age. But we'll come to that in a moment. We can also see from the survival mean value that around about 38% of people in my data set survived the Titanic disaster. The reason for that is, uh, the reason I can tell that is because survived is set to one if they survived and zero if they died. And this is the mean value across the data set. So what, yeah, what we need to do is, because age is a predictor of survivability, we, have, we need to do something with the missing age values. And we have two, two choices here. One is to just delete all the rows with uh, null age and just say that's oh, not important for us. But then we're losing like a quarter of our data set, which also has information on gender and class. So that's probably a silly thing to do. So I would argue that like, instead of just deleting them, we should maybe try and impute those missing age values. And there's lots of different ways of doing that. But I'm going to decide, I'm going to try and do it using the name. And I mentioned already that we have the honorifics and all the names. So with a bit of symbol Python magic, I can actually extract the, uh, the honorific, and I actually create a new column which is called honorific, which just contains that. And now I have that, it's very easy for me to get an overview of how many honorifics I have. i just zoom in there. So we, uh, we can see that most of the people in my data set are misters. And uh, quite a few of them are misses, and miss, and master, and yeah. But then if we go down here, we have like John Keir. I think that's uh, 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 Nederlands, how do you say it? Dutch, sorry. <laughs> I think that's, de that, that's Dutch. And then we have Mademoiselle, and we have Ms. The, the Countess and lady so and so on and so forth. So it's a bit, you know, okay, this is interesting, but maybe we should try and normalize these values a little bit. So that's what I'm going to do next. I'm going to create a nice little map, which allows me to map the existing honorifics to more generic ones. So the ones on the left-hand side are the existing ones, the ones on the right are the new ones. And I found out by doing a bit of research that John Keir is like a sir. I found out also that, uh, what was it? Uh, yeah, mademoiselle is like miss, madame is like missus, and so on and so forth. So what I do is I end up with less honorifics. And then what I can do is using a box plot, 
I can visualize the age distribution for each of the new honorifics I've generated. So I'm not going to go into detail what a box plot is, but like what's great about this is for each honorific, I can see in this green line here, I can see the median age for each honorific. And I can use that to fill in the missing age values. And that's what I do here. Let me just zoom out here again. But finally, I, I just use a bit of Python magic, which basically does that. I think I need to, there we go. But I'm not going to go through the code because that's not interesting. Um, the next thing I need to do is I need to fix the sex categorical variable because it's a string. So what I do is I replace the string with a zero or one. If it's male, I, I replace the uh, string with a zero. And if it's one, I replace it with, sorry, if it's female, I replace it with one. Simple. And then the next thing I do is I've got all these features now in my data set that I'm not going to use anymore. I don't really care. So I've got, my, I've got my survival, I've got my class, I've got my sex and age. That's enough. I don't need all the other stuff, so I'm just going to throw it out. The reason I'm going to throw it out is because I don't want to introduce any of these extra values into my model by accident. So it just makes it easier for me to work with. Right, so does the data we have now, after having you know, messed around with it a little bit, does it reflect our hypothesis? Well, let's look at survivability related to class. We'll zoom in here. So I've generated a, um, a, a nice little bar chart based on the class, one, two, and three. First class is best, second class is second best, and third class is, uh, is uh, Jack Dawson or Leonardo DiCaprio. And we can see that like, you know, those that, are, um, that have the blue values, those are the ones that died. And the ones that are brown, on this screen at least, are the ones that survived. So we can see here that if you're in third class, yeah, you, you, you were, you <laughs> the odds were against you, right? If you're in third class, a lot more people died in third class, in my data set at least, than survived. And in first class, you can see that like, more people survived than died. And in second class, it's approximately the same. So it kind of gives an indication that the idea that survivability related to class is, is a fair one. What about gender? Well, this is also interesting. Here again, we see that, like, uh, remember that gender null is, uh, is male and gender one is female. So here we can see that if you were gender null, in other words, male, the chance of you <laughs> surviving weren't that great. Uh, if you were female, the chance of you surviving were, you know, substantially better, according to my data set. And the final thing is age, and this is a bit different. This is a bit more interesting. Because uh, what we're looking at here is a distribution of data. And uh, basically, where this, this, these two first peaks are above what, uh, zero, those are the people who died. And, the, one, and the, the peak above one are those people who survived. Now, what we can see is a distribution for adults, in other words, people over 15 years, more people died than survived. But the distribution for kids, yeah, more people survived than died, but not that many more. Which is actually, over, you know, for me, was actually surprising, because I thought that I was going to see that like, loads of kids survived and loads of adults uh, died. But when you start thinking about it, if you start looking at the distribution of, uh, of children over classes, there was a lot of kids in third class. And if their parents died, then they probably weren't able to look after themselves. So now I'm going to, I've got my data. I'm, I feel quite comfortable that like, uh, I'm going to get good results. About it. So I'm going to feed it into my machine, machine learning algorithm. And uh, the first thing I want to do is I'm going to split my data into features and labels. So the features, oh, there's definitely something going on with my uh, resolution here. Just bear with me a second while I try and uh, make that a bit nicer. I want to make it readable for you guys, right? So let me just open it up again. Uh, Dropbox. There we go. And then just there and then there. We just open that up again and make it a bit more. And let's see if we can get better results this time. Just run through everything. Sorry about this. This is like uh, previously in my talk. All right, OK, there we go. So what we're doing, yeah. So the first thing we do is we've, we split our data set into features and labels. So the features are the, what, what we're going to use to predict, and the labels is the values we want to get out. And um, then we're going to split our data into testing and training sets. And this is very important. When you're building a machine learning model, you, have, you cannot test your data with the same, you can't tr test your model with the same data that you use to train it. Because then all you're doing is you're asking the model, do you remember this? You're not checking if your model is generalizing. So you always split your data set into training and testing sets. 
And uh, what I do is I'm, I'm saying 25% of my data will be used for testing and 75% will be used for training. And how I select, how I separate the training and the testing data is randomly. So I don't end up like, you know, pulling out 25% of rows that are all after each other because that can also be a bit cheeky. So like, it's basically picking out 25% of random rows to, uh, to uh, comprise the testing set. So then I let my decision tree learn. Based, what I do is I feed my decision tree the, the features, the training features and the training labels. I don't change any hyperparameters. All these values up here, these are hyperparameters. These are like defaults because I haven't set them. And then what I end up is with a model that says, OK, it gives me around about 75% accuracy based on me comparing my, um, my predictions from the model based against real data. So around about 75% accuracy. That's not too bad. It's not too bad. And if I look at the confusion matrix, that gives me more insight. But this confusion matrix, the vanilla confusion matrix, is actually very confusing. <laughs> so that's why it's called a confusion matrix. So I like to actually generate a, a prettier one, which is like down here. If I can just uh, zoom into it, and then you can possibly look at it a bit better. There we go. So in this confusion matrix, what it does is like the true labels uh, the ones uh, are the ones that are like uh, vertical, and the false labels are horizontal. And what we can see, if I just uh, zoom into that, scroll down a little bit. Oh, now you're just being cheeky. There you go. There we go. So what you see is that like, I correctly predicted 114 people died, and I correctly predicted 53 people survived from my 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 testing set. But I got 20 of those who survived wrong, and 36 of those survived. Of those 36 was of those who died wrong. So basically, it gives us an idea of like where we're going wrong here. So what I'm going to try and do is look at the tree. This is the tree that I've actually generated, the decision tree that I've generated. And it's a behemoth. It's a massive decision tree. And that's just for three features. Right? That kind of indicates to me that maybe I've overfitted my model uh, because I haven't set any maximum depth to my tree. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to run the model again. And I'm going to tweak my hyperparameters and say, I'm going to run my model with just three, uh, let it generate just three layers of uh, decision tree. And when I do that, immediately I get a better result. I get 80%. So I've actually got 5% better score just by making my model more generic and less like uh, overfitted. And if I look at the, the uh, confusion matrix, I can see that now I've actually managed to predict 116 died correctly instead of 114. And the biggest change is the amount I predicted uh, who survived. I actually, with the first version of the model, I got 53 right, but now I get 62 right. And if we visualize the tree, which is now limited to three layers, it's a bit easier to kind of like follow. So basically, what I want you to take away from this is that like, by tweaking your hyperparameters and understanding how your tree or how your machine learning algorithm works, you can actually get better results very quickly. I also want you to understand that feature engineering, in other words, playing with your data and make, you know, getting it ready to put into your model is actually the majority of the work you'll be doing as a data scientist. Right, so, yeah. I would say Scikit-Learn and Jupyter Notebooks are very good because they're an easy way to get started with data science. You don't need to sign up for anything. You can just download them for free as part of the Anaconda uh, package. And it, you know, what I would definitely recommend if you want to start playing around with data science is get, download these and look at Kaggle. Because Kaggle have got lots of data sets, including the Titanic data sets, and lots of tips and tricks for getting started. I would say feature engineering, as I mentioned, is a vital skill for all data scientists. And domain, domain knowledge is key. Because if we didn't know about Titanic, we wouldn't have been able to follow this example. Because it would have taken me at least half an hour to explain oh, what the Titanic was, what happened, you know, all the stuff we know from pop culture, I would have had to explain. So domain knowledge is very important. Also, don't, you know, always f remember to split your data into test and training sets. And remember that tweaking your machine learning algorithm can give you better results. So basically, that's it for the talk today. Um, I'll be putting the slides out on my, uh, my, uh, my Twitter 
right after the talk, I'll just put them onto SlideShare first, and then I'll put them up on the, uh, the NDC Oslo uh, hashtag. And other than that, thank you very much for listening. <laughs>